welcome to this week's episode of the Good Gram Show. Okay, um, so this afternoon, like I said last week, uh, this is a what I think is a very special episode of the show. Not that nah, every episode of the show is a special episode, really, at the end of the day, uh, but this one more so because I believe it's the first time, uh, certainly on YouTube, I think, that there is a, a, a video tasting the whiskies produced by a company called James Ely. You're probably going, James who? Um, and I probably I did exactly the same thing when the, com the company contacted me. Never heard of them before. Oh, you bottle whiskey. Oh, okay, fair enough. Um, and a few weeks ago, I kind of you know, took the piss a little bit, didn't I? Uh, about uh, certain certain gin producers that sort of created these wonderful kind of backstories uh, for, for their products that may or may not have had anything at all to do with the the actual product itself or what have you but um, that's certainly not the point with uh, with regards to James Eady because James Eady did indeed exist and was born um, sometime about 1830 I believe uh, born into a family that um, were already in the whiskey industry producing um, blended whiskey and I believe that uh, he uh, left school at 14 and I suppose um, if you leave school in the 1800s at 14 you're either going to the workhouse, to the mill, down pit or if you're quite fortunate and your family has a, a business you're going to go and work for them and I believe that's indeed what uh, what James e Edie did. Um, and then Ten years after that, he decided that it had enough of that and decided to move south. And this is where we get the slight local connection uh, because James apparently moved to Burton-on-Trent, which is just up the road, really, to set up a brewery, as you do. I mean, you know, Burton-on-Trent, synonymous with, with uh, making beer. And apparently carried on working in the, um, the family sort of blending uh, industry and uh, how long? Well, about 30 years after uh, his move down to Burton-on-Trent, he was producing quite a considerable amount of beer, owned about 300 odd pubs, and had basically uh, trademarked his um, his whiskey. The, 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 the legislation, I believe, in 1877 uh, allowed the trademarking of names and things like that. So basically. He just used an X. Yeah. Why not? And so the uh, trademark X whiskey was indeed born. Now, you're probably wondering well, what this is all about. And you're probably thinking, well, it's another one of those ancient blends that's been resurrected by somebody that's got absolutely no, no connection to the original owners or anything like that. But there you'd be wrong, because apparently, yes, it is has been recreated um, and as far as I'm led to believe the the recreation is as close as possible that can be got to uh, James's original recipe and um, well who put it together but some chap well some chap called uh, Rupert Patrick although he didn't actually physically do the blending uh, the blending was done by some guy called Norman Matheson who I believe is um, what's the best way of describing it? Well, a blender for hire, shall we say? Um, or I think there's, I can't remember what he called himself, but um, a, uh, that's essentially what he does. He's sort of like, you know, uh, um, sells his talent, shall we say, to uh, to people that want uh, whiskies being blended. And um, anyway, I'm probably jumping ahead of myself. You, you want to know who this uh, Rupert Patrick guy is, and uh, apparently he was um, or probably still is a director of a company called Whiskey Invest Direct which is an investment platform where you give this company money and they go off and buy casks and I've always been a little bit suspicious of these kind of things I mean I've seen too many of these kind of wine investment schemes kind of go um, tits up shall we say and for me personally if, if I'm going to invest in whiskey I'm either going to buy a bottle of it or a cask you know I'm going to do it that way and and I know uh, 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 people don't necessarily have the 
the, the, the funds or should we say the knowledge uh, to, to do that kind of thing but I'm always a little bit wary but anyway I don't really know anything about that side of his business so I'm not really going to comment apart from what I just said but that's just a personal opinion not about his business but about the whole whiskey investment business as a whole um, and um, so basically yeah he'd been involved in the whiskey industry and um, it, his, his great Great grandfather, um, great great grandfather was James Eady, and he came across some ledgers which uh, he'd obviously been talking about his uh, whiskey and uh, probably his life, I imagine, you know, probably a diary at the end of the day. And um, so he went poking around, he found out some um, family members actually still had bottles of said trademark X, and uh, I believe went and visited the uh, Burton's National Brewery because basically uh, James Eady sold his brewery company in um, Burbs, it doesn't say, so, at some time, sold it to Bass and they ceased uh, production of, uh, of that particular, of the, of the whiskey, uh, the trademark X in 1947 apparently, uh, I'm guessing it's uh, one of those fatalities of the the post-war era and anyway but apparently so we found loads and loads of information and the actual recipe that James E.D. himself used in his trademark X um, blend and apparently most of them he could still get hold of in actual fact I mean um, there was one or two obviously that had gone out of production uh, you know over the years which so the, the, the exact blend is probably just slightly different to, to the original, um, but it contains malt whiskies from Abelor, Ben Rins, Blair Athol, Campbelltown, could be either or both or what have you, of the distilleries, Kalila, Craiglaki, Dalyuan, Glendronach, Glenturret, Lagavulin, interesting, um, Little Mill, even more interesting considering with that shut in 80 something odd, um, Talisker, mm, got hold of some Talisker, um, and two grains from um, Canvas and Cameron Bridge. So, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, pretty much you, you, me, anyone could sort of put together a blend. You know, if you you could you could go to distilleries or brokers or what have you, you can buy these casks. You can't get hold of Talisker or Lagavulin for love nor money, shall we say? Um, in in reality, so how did he? Do it, you're probably wondering. Well, not only was this guy, um, Rupert Patrick, a, a, a chairman or, or a director of this investment company, he was also had worked in the industry, hence obviously knew, had some uh, contacts, shall we say, and was was uh, worked uh, not only in McLeod Distillers, uh, but Beam, uh, Jim Beam and Diageo. Aha! So that's how he managed to get hold of some Lagavulin. Um, so he obviously knew the uh, the right people to whisper in their ear. And um, so, yeah, basically that was the whole kind of concept of, of relaunching the, the trademark X um, blended whiskey. And, but it just didn't kind of want to stay at that kind of point. Obviously there's... There's only so much sales you can make of blended whiskey at the end of the day, and um, I suppose being uh, in charge of a whiskey investment company, I imagine they bought casks. Otherwise, they'd be a pretty crap investment company if they hadn't. And um, I guess at the end of the day, you've gone and got to do something. So I don't know if there's a kind of a relationship between the investment company and James Eady, the independent bottling company. Uh, they, I must admit, I didn't kind of ask that question. Um, but needless to say, they obviously have access to casks, and like all independents, um, they bottle two ranges. You know, they have a 46% range, which they call um, the small batch range, and are produced from anywhere between two and four casks uh, of the, the same the same whiskey. And then they have a single cask range, which they call single cask <laughs> okay yep yeah, right so um, that's fairly logical if you ask me and the, the, the I believe that the the company itself was kind of was set up in 2014 but it wasn't until I think 2016 17 that they actually excuse me 
started to release uh, the whiskey and uh, the trademark X and the uh, the independent stuff that they were bottling. I have a feeling that they did a deal. Uh, they had an exclusivity with another range of shops, uh, but I can't remember if I read that or not, or whether I'm thinking it's Skeen that I did the other week. Um, so I can't honestly remember, but essentially they're looking to sort of like broaden and, and get their whiskies out there, hence why they contacted me and said, we, we bought a whiskey, do you want to buy some? Um, to which my usual comment is, oh, well send me some samples and I'll, have, and I'll have a think about it, you know. And lo and behold, samples duly arrived, and um, quite a number of them in actual fact. So uh, just like to say, you know, a big thank you to Hugh from uh, from the company for arranging the samples, and you know, very much appreciated. And um, hopefully, you'll like my tasting. Um, well, you certainly should do because you know which ones I bought. Because um, yes, I have indeed purchased some of these, and they are actually on the shelves in Shea Gauntly. So um, obviously, I'll tell you which ones were after I've tasted them, and uh, they're on on the website, so you can purchase them on the website. And so, like I said, yes, yeah, so we've got two ranges, and I've made a, a selection from those two ranges that I'm going to uh, taste this afternoon, and um, well, I, think that's, I think I've waffled enough, and my throat's getting a little bit dry, so I think it's time to taste some whiskey. I know you Actually, I better introduce what I'm going to taste first before I taste I'm going to get ahead of myself while I taste some whiskey. Um, right, okay, so we're going to kick off with the ubiquitous um, trademark X. I mean, that's the, the logical place to start. It's bottled at 40... Hmm, 45.6, I think. I really should have written it down and I haven't got it here in front of me, but I think it's 45.6 or um, 46... 46.5, I think. Um... Oh, I don't know. Somebody's going to tell me what it is, and I'll probably look it up at the end and go, "Oh God, it's that!" You know. Anyway, um, I think I think it's forty-six point five. But anyway, um, that's what we're going to kind of start off with. The second bottle we'll be looking at is what the first in the um, small batch range. This is an eight-year-old or Kruisk. Um, it has uh, uh, a vatting of four first fill um, uh, American Standard barrels. Um, barrels number eight one seven. 984 through to uh, 87. It was distilled in 2007, bottled in 2016 at 46%. And then we're going to move on to the single cast ones, <laughs> pretty quick. Uh, this is a nine year old Strath Mill, which I, I was quite impressed by. You don't see very much Strath Mill, certainly not privately bottled, and very rarely do you kind of come across it at sort of sub 10 years old. And I was thinking, ooh, single cask, nine year old Strath Mill could be interesting. Um, so it was distilled in 2008, bottled in uh, 2018 at 59%. Ooh, that's 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 got some got some poke, shall we say? Uh, it's a um, aged in a recharred hoggy uh, number 806273, and there's 258 bottles. And you know that actually got me kind of thinking about the the. the why are independently bottled whiskies uh, and certainly cast strength whiskies, why are they so much more expensive? And the obvious answer is the angel share. Um, if you think about it, um, Hogshead holds approximately 358 bottles when it's, it's first filled up with new make spirit. So over the course of nine years, this particular cask has lost about 100 bottles. I mean, just, just stop and think about that. That's 170 CL bottles that, of liquid that have just disappeared into the ether. Um, so if you do some rough calculations, divide that by nine, it works out at 11 bottles per year that it's <laughs> losing. Um, and if you do a linear calculation with regards to that as a percentage, it works out at 28% uh, of the... the the original volume of the cask has disappeared, or roughly about 3% per year. I know that you, in reality it's compounded, etc, etc, but I'm I'm a whiskey taster, I'm not a bloody mathematician. So anyway, I mean 3% per year is quite on the high side for, for, for Scotland. I mean, you would expect between 1% and 3%, I suppose. Um, and... Um, you know, so by the time you've got to nine years old, you know you've lost a hundred bottles of uh, of your of your stock already, and 
however much you paid for it. So obviously that sort of liquid has obviously cost a damn sight more if you kind of pro rata it. But anyway, so so yeah, I thought that was that was that was actually quite interesting. We just sort of just just kind of made me think, you know, about, uh, about those greedy angels, shall we say. And the fact why some old whiskies are woody as hell and sort of, you know, because uh, it's kind of like a, you know, a, a barrel that once had held 350 odd bottles and you finally get around to bottling it and there's a teaspoon left in the bottom. Yes, it's going to be woody. Um, but anyway, um, that's that's by the by. The uh, fourth bottling we're looking at, again, is a single cask bottling. Uh, this is a 14 year old Blair Athol from a refill sherry uh, refill sherry butt. Um, I just couldn't read my own writing then for a minute. Uh, uh, butt number 99. <laughs> that's a big butt. Um, so, yeah, so that's that. Uh, it was distilled in uh, 2004 and bottled in 2018 at 59.8. I ha hasten to add, I mean, which is a hell of an ABV really for a 14 year old whiskey. I mean, um, that I guess must have been matured in a sort of a, a, a pretty uh, pretty hot environment. I imagine to sort of like keep that kind of level of uh, alcohol. Although I think the number of um, bottles is, again it was five hundred and twenty nine from a hog, uh, from a, a butt and. I think a butt's about 500 litres, so again, I, th I think I, I calculated that at about the same sort of um, loss of around about 3%. And the uh, penultimate bottling we'll be looking at is an old canvas. Oh, I do like my old grains, uh, as you well know. And this is a 24-year-old canvas, uh, a single cask thereof, uh, distilled in 1993, bottled this year uh, at 54.9%. It's from Sherry Butt, um, and it is Butt number 48093. Incidentally, the Blair Athol is a refill Sherry Butt, not a first fill. And judging from the colour, yeah, probably is a first fill. And finally, a bit of peat, because you know I like a bit of peat. So uh, we're going to finish off going back to the um, small batch range. This is a 10-year-old called Ela. Uh, distilled in 2007, bottled this year at 46%, uh, aged in refill bourbon casks, uh, I think it's refill, uh, refill, uh, for, uh, yes, it says refill, yes, yeah, refill, refill uh, hogsheads. Um, again, I couldn't read my bloody writing. Uh, and the cask numbers were 314428 through 2430. So there you have it. That's this afternoon's little lineup. And now my throat really is parched, so let's taste some whiskey. Right, okay, so we're going to kick off with the trademark X. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? That is a really nice nose. Um, it's got some obvious peat. Um, we're not talking huge amounts, but the peat is, is pretty noticeable. Um, it's got some crisp, fresh, space id um, white fruits, it's got some underlying sort of rich darker multi fruits um, so I'm kind of guessing that you kind of got the sort of the, the Blair Athol, uh, the Dal Ewan and possibly um, possibly the kind of um, sort of Glen Scotia-y kind of maltiness that's kind of like forming a bedrock um, there's a little bit of earth a little bit of sawdust it's got a, a bit of a bit of a prickle. It's got a youthfulness. I mean, I was reading in, in the notes about it that um, originally uh, uh, they believed that uh, that James Eady was using 16-year-old um, Lagavulin, and uh, they couldn't get hold of any of that. I mean, uh, yeah, and even if you are going to get hold of a 16-year-old Lagavulin, they're going to charge you an arm and a leg, even if you did actually work for the company um, once. Um, I like that nose. The it, it's I think it's fifty four percent malt somewhere around there, and it certainly has plenty of malt. The grain is just noticeable. It's just a you know an intimation of sort of crisp spices, um, and to me this is kind of like the the ideal blend. You know you you want sort of like a predominant malt base with a little bit of of, of grain input, and um, that is a really nice nose. I I like that and. Um, and I mean, we've got it on on the shelves of what about forty three three quid something like that. Um, and um, you know, what? I would certainly recommend um, 
certainly recommend uh, uh, that whiskey. Let's see what the palace like. Hmm, that's a nice finish. Rich, a bit more oak character on the palate, a bit more creamy American oak with a touch of sherry dried fruits. Again, nice, weighty, malty, um, good structure to it. Uh, there's a little bit of, of, of crisp Speyside fruit, touch of salt, a little bit of peat. Um, grain kind of comes through on the end and just adds to that kind of freshen, freshening of the palate on the finish. Um, but there's enough malt there to make it sort of... Um, not feel too austere and too grainy. That's one of the big issues I have with, with, with blended whiskies is that they can often tend to be, uh, have a nice progression and kind of kick off with the malt, but you know you end up with the finish being predominantly all about the grain and they can get a bit, a bit dry, a bit austere, uh, and because kind of like the malt hasn't kind of kept pace with the grain, if you see what I mean. Um, but this certainly does, and I think this has got a really, really nice progression. And, um, there's a little bit of maturity kind of working there. It's not not too young. Uh, the, the focus is more on the sort of like the, the youthfulness, but the maltiness is really nice. And um, yeah, I, I I I definitely recommend that. I think you should buy that. Okay, so let's move on to the Akroisk. Uh, let's see what noise gives us on this thing, shall we? That's an interesting nose for a Kruisk. Um I mean, it's got that sort of slightly sort of minerally kind of fresh Speyside kind of um, character. Although there's a, a bit of kind of cigar leaf in the background, cigar stroke tea leaf, um, which is interesting. Um, touch of white fruit, a little bit of oak. Um, yeah, it's all very pleasant, it has to be said. Um, yeah, I kind of like that. There's a little bit of pepper coming out now as well. I mean, or Kreuz is one of those kind of, again, no one's, uh, it's sort of hit and miss. I mean, I, I've had some, some ropey old or Kreuz, it has to be said. Um, but by and large, it tends to be sort of kind of classically spay, crisp and fresh, and, you know, um, a bit sort of you know, blender's fodder, I suppose. But... Um, you know, pleasant enough on, on a kind of warm day. Um, and, uh, you know, this has got, got a bit of depth to it, a bit of, bit, bit of sort of rich fruit, um, you know, so it's a, a little bit more than just sort of like, you know, one-dimensional. But um, anyway, let's, let's see what power goes. Richer, denser, more honey, a little bit more oak. I'm certainly getting a bit of almost kind of clotted cream, um, honeycomb, a little bit of dried spice. Just a touch on the short side, it has to be said. It does kind of, I mean, it's got a nice spicy aftertaste, it has to be said. You know, a little bit of, of almost kind of peppery kind of spice, but it does kind of tail off a bit. I mean, I suppose at the end of the day, well, it is just eight years old. Um, but it's got a nice, a nice finish, crisp, fresh, um, quite invigorating. You know, uh, I, I can kind of forgive it a little bit of shortness on the finish because it is a, it's, it's a lovely little malt. It has to be said at the end of the day. And I, I mean, I, I don't know how much that retail for. It's not one that I've actually purchased at the moment because it was part of a second batch of samples that I received. Um, I got sent the new releases that they bottled in 2018, rather than some of their older stuff, which they kindly sent later. Um, but you know, I kind of, I kind of like that. That's that's nice. I mean, they, they bottled um, how many bottles are there? One thousand four hundred and forty-four. So probably been knocking around for a little while. But you know, I thought that was uh, that was that was a pleasant. Right, okay, okay, on to the Strath Mill. Let's, let's see what this gives us, then, shall we? 
Do you know what? That is a lovely nose. Um, it is so lovely, in fact, that one of them is going into my collection. Um, the, uh, you know, it's it, it's been described as, as the orange muscat of the whiskey world, and it does indeed have that kind of musky, well, not quite muscatty in, in this instance, but it has a sort of musky uh, um, kind of orange character. Uh, it has some hay some straw it actually smells a lot more mature than, than nine years old it has to be said um, there's some honey some barley touch of citrus and although this is 59% 59% the alcohol feels really well contained and this is often not an issue but you know uh, if you sort of come across a sort of very young whiskey uh, high ABV and you get a really intense nose prickle it sometimes bodes badly for when you put water with it um, because if the alcohol is not particularly well contained within the malt it kind of not splits off but it, it kind of gets a bit disjointed certainly if you add water to it and it just not falls apart but um, um, the alcohol just kind of the, 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 the other components fall apart but the alcohol just kind of remains even if you do dilute it quite considerably um, the same can be said for older whiskies that are bottled at a high ABV as well I sort of, you know you sort of come across those and you think oh hello uh, that ain't gonna that ain't gonna take water particularly nicely um, but anyway kind of coming back to this one this one is absolutely gorgeous really really nice not not sort of orange the curry uh, but it has that kind of enhanced kind of orange citrus kind of character um, straw malt barley yeah this is just a lovely whiskey this is really nice so um let's see what the palette is oh that's a wonderful juicy chewy finish and even though it's 59%, that alcohol is just so well contained. It prickles a little bit on the finish, a little bit of mouth-watering, masking character, um, but it's beautifully juicy. Loads of orange conserve, uh, tangerine, malt, barley. I mean, it's not m probably the most majorly complex whiskey on the face of the planet, but what it delivers, it really delivers really, really nicely. And as I have my water... <laughs> my, my water butt <laughs> um, filled I'm going to add a little drop of water although I really don't think it needs it I mean you know and uh, it's very rare will you come across a whiskey that's bottled at this kind of ABV that you could get away with <laughs> drinking it neat um, but anyway let's see what the uh, nose gives us now dumbs the, the, the sort of the orange citric kind of character down a little bit so I'm getting a little bit more straw a little bit more oak some sort of almost kind of manure earthiness kind of coming through. It's got a it's got a lovely kind of natural kind of character. Um, a little bit more honeycomb as well. It's got an, a bit of an edge to it now, um, but not a kind of dirty edge. It's kind of a bit sort of bit Weetabixy cereally kind of now. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of showing its age or lack thereof. Um, but you know what? I still really like this. See what the palette's like now. Mmm. Now that is why I like this whiskey. This is absolute superb. Really juicy. I mean, salivating with the juiciness of it. It has to be said. Um, really citric. It's got. It's kind of the, the dilution has brought out a little bit of. Um, almost kind of granulated sugar so that kind of you've got that kind of sugar sprinkled kind of orange citric kind of character and it's just oh the balance is just absolutely delightful i mean that was one hell of a damn good cask for a nine-year-old i mean i've got three bottles of it left so if it's kind of and it's not too expensive either as well um uh, even though it's a single cask and bottled at that abv and but it's only nine years old so they couldn't get away with charging too much for it but that's going to fly off the shelf, so if you're interested in a bottle, get in touch with me as soon as possible. Right, 
Right, okay, so let's move on to the 14-year-old Blair Athol. So, uh, refill Sherry Buck, let's see what nose gives us on this. Nice earthiness. Um, touch of dried fruit. Got picked up the, the character of this actually in the um, in the trademark X. Um, although obviously there's things like uh, Glendronach, um, which is obviously going to be uh, the sherry matured. And um, but it's nicely balanced. It's got some honey. It's got some barley. It's not just a, a one-trick pony. It's not just all about the sort of like the the, the sherry character. Um, although that is obviously noticeable. Um, nice amount of spice. Pleasantly mature. It's starting to show a little bit of baked fruit, um, but still retains that sort of kind of fresh barley kind of character. This this is kind of. This is my sort of sherried whiskey, it has to be said, and, um, you know, uh, I do like sherried malts, but, you know, you ha like, as you well know, I don't see the point in drinking a big sherry monster, uh, you know, because if I wanted to drink sherry, I'd go and crack a bottle of sherry open. Um, th this is just kind of adding a little bit of sherry character, and I really like this. It's absolutely lovely. Let's see what the power's like. Did I say that? It was 59.8. Again, really well contained alcohol. Yep, yeah, again, it's a bit of a mouth water and prickle on the finish, as you would expect. But that kind of emphasises the spices. A um, little bit of wood smoke, um, which is quite interesting. Again, really nicely balanced. A nice uh, interplay between the dried fruits of the sherry cask and um, the barley and a little bit of honey. Um, a touch of baked apple. Um, touch more honey. Bit is a little bit on the finish, but again, it's got plenty of sort of like malt character. It's got plenty of honey, um, which kind of balances that out. And uh, like I said, the alcohol is just really well contained in that. So I'm going to put a little drop of water with it and see what happens. Um, but again, I quite happily drink that at natural cast strength. I mean. I probably might not get through too many glasses of the stuff at 59.8, but, you know, I'd certainly drink it. That, you know, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, oh, that's lovely now. I mean, that is, that's kind of pushed down the sherry. The sherry has kind of really been, you know, um, sort of sunk to the bottom, I suppose, for want of a better word. And it's wonderfully aromatic, wonderfully barley, and kind of classically... Um, Blair Athol, or should we say, it's kind of aping Blair Athol aged in American oak, or should we say Blair Athol at its best aged in American oak. A um, little bit of, obviously the sherry counter is still noticeable, a uh, little bit of spice, a little bit of pepper, but a oh, bit of cereal as well, um, kind of, you know, but it's kind of got a nice kind of balance between the youthful elements and the slightly more mature elements. Again, I think this was just you know, a lovely cask to actually bottle at this kind of age, so see what the parts like now. A little bit more simpler on the palate. Nice, rounded, soft, more oak vanillins. Um, again, slightly bitter on the finish. I kind of personally prefer it neat, it has to be said, although it's probably easier to drink when it's had a drop of water. It's less interesting on the palate with, uh, with when it's diluted, but still really, really good. And, um, yeah, that's my kind of refill sherry butter. Right, okay, so let's move on to a bit of old grain then. So this is the 24-year-old canvas. Let's see when those give us on this thing, shall we? Now I tend to find that grains matured in sherry seem to work quite nicely more often than not. Um, and this is no exception, it's kind of got that kind of nice interplay between 
the sherry dried fruits and the spirit dried fruits. There's a touch of chocolate, some coffee, some manure. It's actually a bit stinky, it has to be said, but not in a not in a sulfurous manner, shall we say, in a more kind of sort of manure-y kind of way, which I kind of like, you know. Um, there's a touch of coconut, a little bit of um, a little bit of citrus. Yeah, I mean, this has got some nice, nice characteristics. I mean, often um, the sort of grains can be a little bit one-dimensional because they're not the most complex of, uh, of beasties on the planet, and they do rely on the character of the uh, cask to kind of give it some, some more um, uh, complexity. And you know, I like this. I think this has definitely got it. It's got it's got a lovely coffeeed character. Um, sort of almost kind of um, Colombian possibly that sort of medium to sort of medium high kind of roast um, it's not quite sort of dark as maybe sort of French coffee or something like that it is certainly sort of that in that kind of Colombian kind of mode um, and no I'm not talking Colombian nose candy um, anyway so coming back to the whiskey this is a lovely lovely whiskey and um it's it's the sort of the, the more youthful end of the um, sort of maturing kind of uh, grain whiskies. I mean, it's certainly not certainly not in its nappies, and it's certainly not sort of you know got its walking stick out. But it's kind of nicely in the middle. It's yeah, really quite pleasant. Let's see what the power's like. Chewy, dusty, licorice, coffee aftertaste. Um, kind of opens up with some nice kind of rummy dried fruits, a little bit of coconut. In slides the sherry, that sort of sherry dried fruit, spice, a um, bit of chocolate, a bit of coffee, a um, bit of tannin. Um, nice kind of intense spicy finish uh, I mean it's bottled watch 54.9 um, almost kind of chilli spice my, my tongue is kind of tingling away going ooh um, that is actually really very very nice it has to be said and um, it, like I said nice balance between between the cask and the, the grain whiskey and, and I, like I said I tend to find that sort of grain whiskies work really quite nicely when aged in 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 uh, sherry butts so and um, that certainly no exception right okay so let's move on to the Kalila let's see what the notes give us on this end shall we nice that's quite a full Kalila quite quite sexy in actual fact um quite rounded and broad and barleyed and almost sweet and there's there's quite a bit of oak actually um for for Kalila and um there's the medicinal peat there's the freshness there's the saltiness there's the, the citrus notes it's that is a, a lovely lovely Kalila you know can't say too much more about it than that really it's just kind of really nicely balanced nice amount of oak nice richness um Hmm. See what the power gives. Again, rich, quite sweet. Lots of barley, lots of vanilla. But nicely salty, it's got some slightly medicinal peat, a little bit of soot, um, quite fresh on the finish. It's got a lovely progression, it kind of moves through the gears quite nicely, it kind of kicks off with the oak and then moves into the spirit. I mean, sometimes Kalila can be a little bit thin uh, and a little bit one dimensional, but you know, when it's got some nice kind of barley character, and this is not. I would say the sort of the most peatiest of Kolilas that I've ever come across. It's kind of mid, 
mid ground in the in the sort of peating levels and it's just really really nicely balanced and um hmm, really quite impressive <laughs> So that's some of today's episode of the show up. Um, firstly, like I say, uh, a big, big thank you to um, James Eady for sending the samples. Um, always appreciated, but um, like I said, it's kind of, with all the independents, and everyone in particular, they, you, you get emails and stuff like that about our new bottlings and all this kind of stuff, and it's just, it's kind of, you know, it's not like with wine, for example. I mean, you know, with, with, with wine, you can read about uh, the climactic conditions, the, the vintage notes, and there's you know r various experts, shall we say, uh, that um, post their comments online, and um, you can make your decision from that. From that, not necessarily without having to actually physically taste the wine. Um, whiskey, completely different. You know, <laughs> yeah, you can read about sort of you know or have knowledge of a particular distillery and how, how their sort of whiskies generally tend to taste but until you actually physically taste a single cask because as we know single casks vary quite considerably so um that's it or a big big thank you for the samples uh so trademark x yeah i think that's a lovely blend um good amount of malt good balance between the malt and the uh, the, the grain components and good balance of complexity from the various casks that uh, that were used in the blend. Whether it, I, I don't know whether um, never having tasted the original and you know, maybe uh, the company has an open bottle of the original and would kindly send me a sample of it. I don't honestly know. It's difficult to say how it kind of matches up to the original. I'm guessing that um, having tasted. The, the Shackletons, which was a uh, recreation of the of the original blend, and they did the spectrum analysis and all that kind of stuff. Um, it tasted like an old whiskey. This particular um, whiskey doesn't taste like it's an old whiskey. It tastes up to date, modern, um, and I'm guessing probably less rough than it might well have tasted back in the 1800s, shall we say? But in, in needless to say, I think that's a lovely blend. Um, the Akroisk, yeah, I mean, a bit short possibly, um, but pleasant, you know, nice space eyed kind of whiskey, um, ideal for a summer's day, should we say, like today. Um, the Strathmill, love that, absolutely gorgeous, really, really nice whiskey, um, for such a young whiskey and for such a uh, high ABV, dangerously drinkable, shall we say, and uh, really very, very nice. Um, the the Blair Athol, um, yep, not too much on on the sherry character, so certainly didn't swamp the distillery character, shall we say? And that's always what I'm on the lookout for. I bang on and on and on about balance, and uh, that one certainly had uh, had a very very good balance. Really very very enjoyable. Uh, the canvas, um, yeah, lovely. Worked really nicely in sherry. Uh, again really well balanced you know you had the sherry component you had the the dried fruit characteristics of the of the grain and you know nice maturity just about right i think and the kalila again you know certainly not one dimensional not a peat monster nice amount of peat um kind of classically sort of mid-ranged um kalila as far as peating levels concerned but plenty of barley um and and plenty of balancing sweetness so certainly not one dimensional so really very very nice so um all of these apart from the acroisk are currently available from us they're on the website so you know if they kind of tick your boxes so to speak then feel free to uh, to, to purchase or uh, you know drop them to the shop if you're local um next week I have another special episode of the show. All episodes of the show are special, of course, as I said at the beginning. But yes, it's a very, very special episode of the show, and I shall give you a, a big, big clue. North Star. Enough said. So, until next week, good afternoon and good ramming.